Hi, everyone. It's really good to be here. Um, before I start, I just want to congratulate Chu Ye and Ken Lin. This is a remarkable achievement. It's a quarter of a century. I mean, that's a really very big achievement. I don't know any other people who work as hard. I really don't. I thought I was a workaholic until I met them. Um, they're amazing. They stick to their values all the time. And apart from anything else, they're kind. And that matters a lot to me. They're really kind. It's been my pleasure to work with them for probably around 20 years now. Um, and I, I, love, I love working with them. I value our friendship. And it's been wonderful to meet so many of you in Singapore. Um, it's sort of the pandemic is very sad. I just wish I was there today, but I'm not. So fantastic to be here. And it's great to have you all here. Nice early one this morning. And I'm going to talk to you today about writing. Writing is really my probably the best, my most favorite thing to teach, to be honest. And I truly believe that every single child in the world has got a writer inside them. And I believe you do too. I believe that we all have got this, this writing um, awareness inside us, that we've all got this ability to write and that we've all got um, the ability to write really well as well. So that's what I'm going to be talking about. And I, I won't go over an hour, I promise. You know, it's the sort of thing I could talk about for a long, long time. By the way, I thought the videos were amazing. I watched the videos and saw myself getting more lines and getting fatter all the way through each one. But, um, but they were brilliant videos. So thank you very, very much for that. Just going to share my screen. Um, let me just say, I'm just going to move a few things around. Okay, so I hope, I hope you can all see it. Um, it looks to me like you can from here. I think that every kid that I teach loves writing. And I think that our job as parents, teachers, educators, friends of kids, coaches, whatever we are, is really to open doors for these children and to make sure that they are able to get their creativity out. But before I start, I want to ask you, when do you write? All right, you might want to put something in the chat box for me. When do you write? And do you write for pleasure? Because with children, we always think, well, we should do, you know, creative writing, you know, as well as writing in all the, the nonfiction genres and, and whatnot. But when do you write yourselves? And do, do children see you writing? Because if they don't see you actually writing, well, then they're not really going to think that it's very high importance. So when do you write? Did you write as a kid? Did you enjoy it? What If you did write as a kid, and I'm presuming that you did, what, what did you like about the writing process? What, what was good about it? You know, when did you feel really satisfied with it? You know, I can remember talking to Ken Lin a couple of years ago before lockdown about writing, and he, he spoke to me um, about a particular writing topic that he'd had at school and how much he really enjoyed it. And I thought, wow, that's amazing that Ken Lin can think right back to that particular time in school, and I think it was primary school, if I remember rightly, and he can remember actually having that topic and how good it felt. So, so we, do, we do remember our achievements when it comes to literacy and when it comes to anything, but writing is quite, quite a deep process. Now, I can remember when um, Chu Ye and I started to write together, I can remember... We both experienced how difficult it was, how the editing process was hard and everything, but the actual feeling of getting the creativity out, of being able to write a story, to really get to children, to get to adults as well, that was utterly amazing. And I will never, ever forget that feeling of working with somebody and being able to write something of substance, something important. But children feel this too. Children feel this too. So do you believe it's important that kids learn to write? You know, how do you, 
how do you feel about this? And should they still write creatively? Now that we've got all these movies and computers and iPads and everything, do we still need creative writing? And, and how does this benefit children? What does this actually do? So when you do write and you write, I'm talking mainly about create, creative writing today, what does that actually do for you? You know, the way, the way I experience that, and I think the way that Chuye experienced it when we were writing, was it's, it's like an outlet for your thoughts, but you have to craft them. As they come out of your head, you have to craft them. You have to be aware of your audience. And when you get words on the page that feel right, that is the most incredibly satisfying moment. It really is. And I, I you know, I've been teaching for many years. You can sort of see that, you know. And I really believe that every kid is a writer, that we all are. So, you know, if you've got imagination, if you can harness kids' imagination and creative thinking, and if you can teach them to plan and use the basic writing skills, that's how you get successful writing. So it is not all about editing, spelling, grammar, all of those things. They're important, really important. But if you don't have that spark, if you don't have that creative thinking there, then you're not going to have any sort of story or any, any writing that's worthwhile actually reading. So, so we know that there are particular conditions. We know this from research that conditions that will really help children to be able to write. And we, we know that number one, and you've, I'm sure you've heard this so many times, but is to be read to on a regular basis. This one is totally essential. And I don't mean read to by reading books. I'm talking about read to with quality children's literature. Having a, a wide variety of books within your home accessible to children, paper, pencils, paints, accessible for children as well. You know, don't try and keep the home beautiful. If you want your kids to be creative, make sure that you've got all of these tools around all the time. Also, we need adults and teachers who stimulate interest by answering questions that the kids ask, um, asking questions from them, praising their efforts at reading and writing, you know, getting to the library on a regular basis and to bookshops and, you know, um, help the kids to write stories, let them dictate to you occasionally and display them. You know, be, be excited about them. Don't just pick them up and go, oh, there's a spelling mistake on here. You know, look at what they're trying to actually say to you. There, there are writing stages that children pass through and at each stage there are particular things that we need to do to nurture children. And it's not about going through these stages fast. That is not the important thing. So the first stage is what I call them the meaningful marks. Um, we'll say a little bit more about that a little bit later. Experimental. And then stage three, early. And that's pretty much, you know, when they, they start getting into K1, K2. And then we've got developing, you know, when the writing skills are developing. That's actually quite an exciting stage. And then we've got the conventional stage. And, of course, there are other stages after that. But what we all want is to get our children towards the conventional stage. So let's just have a, a little word about each of these. Meaningful marks is, is quite exciting when the kids pick up a pencil or a crayon or a marker and they just do scribbling. It looks random, but it actually starts to be controlled, often a circular movement. Um, the scribbles start to gradually look a bit like writing. All right, but they won't develop if they don't see their parents writing. And I mean writing with a pencil or a pen. You need to actually do this in front of your children. You know, when you're making a shopping list or something like that, don't always do it on your iPad. Sometimes write it on a piece of paper. Right. So make sure that you model this. Um, no, they know that drawings, by the way, can be communication. They'll often read you their drawing as a message to tell you something. And it's about this stage that pencil hole develops. And so you have to think what's needed at this stage. Well, what's needed is reading to them a lot and modelling to them a lot and a, a lot of praise, a lot of well done. 
that's fantastic. Let's put that on up on the fridge. Let's send that to grandma. Um, experimental. Experimental is just a, a little bit on from that last stage. They start to give a message to the symbols. And you get you get things like letter-like symbols starting to emerge. You can see it in this example. They often use the letters from their own name, and they're very aware that the print carries a message. They're also aware that print and writing, that they're writing and they're drawing, sorry, are different, and they know that mum and dad get really excited when they're actually doing writing. They know that writing occurs in lines. Now, they won't know this if they don't see somebody write. If they don't see writing going on at home, if the teacher doesn't model writing to them and show them how it's done, they, they won't actually get these understandings. So even though at the moment I think that, you know, what we're teaching them is still really relevant, really working, if we stop writing in front of children, we won't get the same results. We definitely won't. So we still need to read to them a lot, need to provide paper, you know, we need to show them environmental print and they need to see us writing. You know, and this is the sort of thing that you start to get, right? This is actually from my, my cousin's child um, who, I mean, he's, he's an amazing guy. He actually um, has helped her so much and he's always um, gets her motivated and excited. He doesn't mark out her mistakes. And she has become a really competent little writer because of that. And she, she writes with joy, with absolute joy. Then, you know, you get children who are not actually ready to write down any words, but they've got words in their head. They've all got words in their head and their heart. So I went walking, what did I see? And then what he wanted to say was, I saw a monster looking at me. That's what he told me. He didn't want to write it. He said, Auntie Vicky, I'm not, I'm not ready. I can't. So I wrote it down for him. And then he traces over it. So there are lots of different ways that we can respond to children, especially kids who are not quite confident, not quite ready. That's perfectly all right. That is perfectly all right. If the words are in their head, let them tell you and then you can actually write them down or they can say them onto the iPad in Word and the words just come up. Then we've got early, early writing stage where they are now really aware that speech can be written down. And they're experimenting with letters and words. Spaces might be happening, hopefully. Um, the messages stay the same. And they start starting to realise that when you read a book, the words don't change each time. So they, they're getting these skills like left to right organisation. And they know this is very exciting. They, they know that they can express themselves at this stage. This is where I think that teachers are so lucky. We're totally blessed when we're teaching kids how to write because it's almost like, you know, it's like a new birth, a literacy birth that is going on. Um, they are starting to read back and experiment with familiar forms. And they, they often rely on the most obvious sounds of a word. So if they want to write house, they'll often write H and S. Now, what is needed is to read to them, to praise them, to motivate, to model, but definitely to teach them about phonics and about synthetic phonics at this stage. And this is where I have no doubt that Jolly Phonics is the very best program. So if you want your kids to be able to write really well, and if you want them to have the skills, make sure that they get Jolly Phonics and Jolly Grammar. Whether they don't get it at their school or not, it doesn't matter. You make sure that they are taught that because it will accelerate them. And that will then give them, it will sort of give them a key to be able to be wildly creative because they'll know what the rules are. And it makes it so much easier for them. So at this stage, um, they're often very self-obsessed. They seem to go on being like that for rather a long time. Um, this little girl wanted to write about, you know, being a hairdresser. She was obsessed by, by hair. They, they write about their worries, what they're concerned about, you know, and that, that's okay. They're at that stage. This kid had been through an anti-bullying course that I run. And so he felt that he was the boss of himself. So they, they write about their feelings. They get to know themselves in writing as well. I'm just go, I'll go back to that in a minute. Um, this kid was in that stage. He was amazing. And his parents allowed him the freedom to experiment, allowed him the freedom to experiment with words. Now, just need to go back to that and see if I can 
get that working again. Sorry. Um, so, Zach, what have you been doing today? Did you make a book about the jungle book? Yeah, and, and I don't have all the characters. You don't have all the characters yet. Okay. Could you add some of the characters in later, do you think? Good. I don't have the snake, and I don't have the kitty, and the kitty, and the kitty, and the money, and the money, and rupture, and rocky, and the cub, Oops, and the um, monkeys, and the gorilla, and the the Okay, there are a lot of characters in your book, aren't there? Yeah. Okay, do you want to show me some of the book? Could you show me some of the pictures and some of the writing in your book, Zach? Yeah. Do you want me to show you Shere Khan? Yeah, could you do that? Well, there he is. Let's have a look. And what does he do? He's, he's the baddie. He's the baddie, you see. Yeah, like a Kayla wins to fight him. A Kayla wins. Is a Kayla a wolf? Oh, he's the bad. He's the bottom wolf and he wins. He won the fight. Here comes. I think I better read the jungle book and then I'll know more about them, won't I? Can you show me a bit more of your book? Yeah. I can't believe that you did a whole book today. It's Kelly, that's fantastic. That's Barlow. Oh, okay. And you wrote, did you write the words as well? Yeah. Fantastic. I don't really know what Barlow does. Okay. Well, maybe we can find that out, couldn't we? Right. Yeah, and that's Daddy Wolf. Oh. He finds Mowgli and she can't us through. Right. Okay, I'm going to stop it there. But this kid, he, he just loved writing so much. He was three, turning four, and... Um, you know, his parents weren't authors or anything like that, but they just they just allowed him to experiment and they read to him so much. And and that that's what we need. That's really what we need. So in the developing part, you start to see um, more text forms. The kids get to understand a little bit about a sentence. They're generally starting to start jolly grammar. So they've got some idea of what a sentence actually means. And, and if they are using jolly grammar, then they're going to be um, learning about verbs and they're going to be learning about nouns. They're going to be looking at how sentences are constructed. So that, And they're starting to do a bit more proofreading and editing. Um, they, they still want to write on personally significant topics, all right? It's hard sometimes to get them to move away from themselves. Um, and they will reread to check sequence. If they're writing a lot, what we need to remember is the fact that we might need to help them with the editing because sometimes if a kid's written three pages of their own ideas and all the creative things that are coming out of their head, that's a lot to edit. So that's where we have to come in and we have to help with that. So they need a lot of encouragement at this stage, you know, um, and they need a lot of topics that mean something to them. So I always get the kids every year to write to Santa. Right, and I tell them you can't just write a long list of what you want. You need to actually write to Santa. He likes to get a proper letter, you know. So this kid said, you know, are your reindeer alive? Can you die? And I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, you know, he's been around a long time. You know, my my mum and dad knew him. My grandparents knew him. He's been there so long. So how come he's still alive? And then he asked, which amazed me, is Mrs. Claus pregnant? Okay. Spelling not correct, but, you know, the, the idea was there. Um, you, all, you get this sort of thing from children that age too. The spelling and the grammar and the paragraphing and whatnot may not quite be there yet, but they're starting to really let their ideas go. So this kid had watched um, a video, a YouTube video about clouds, okay, and got very, very excited about it. And she wanted to write about, you know, her special place was in the clouds and there was a gate to a castle and lovely footpath of flowers and really, really carried away. But then, but then was able to work on this and craft this really nicely. And to also talk about, you know, the use of adjectives to improve your writing. So at this stage, they're starting to learn, how do I improve my writing? And this is where we need to be like a coach and to help them. Um, my grandma gives us treats. We ask her to go to the shops to buy us stuff. She buys us a, 
um, a lolly and a toy. She plays this frog game with us. I love her so much. She is great fun. And now Alexi was really good at actually putting together a lovely little bit of writing. She had to describe somebody she loved in this bit of writing. So her, her structure was really good. But what I had to point out to her was, you haven't really described your grandma. You haven't told me what she looks like. You know, I don't know what she's really interested in. So let's describe her as well. So she was a child that got the structure, but didn't actually have that, didn't, you know, wasn't able to get her um, words about grandma in there. So we, we had to do a little bit of work to help her with that. Um, this was a poem that a child wrote about spring. So it's spring here in Perth at the moment. And the kids are doing lots of art and, and painting and poems and whatnot about spring at the moment. So this was, I love this bit of writing. It was, it was quite poetic. Welcome to bright colours, waking animals, beautiful butterflies, warmer sunshine, the season of birth for animals, growing flowers and open flower gardens. It was beautiful, absolutely. And, and what was really nice about that writing was that particular child had had so many difficulties getting her ideas down. Um, this, is, this is an example of a child who wanted to write a whole page desperately. So when she got to the, the last word, me, she just did a great big heart, all right, to fill up the page because she wanted to have um, a full page. And she was at a school where all the kids had at least two or three tutors and they could all write pages and, you know, but she, she wasn't able to yet. So she, she, you can see she's underlined words that she thinks that she's got wrong to have another go at. What she needed was confidence. And she didn't need my red pen all over her work. She needed me to write back. So I said to her, I'm glad she went to the nurse with you. You know, I hope you weren't badly hurt. I wanted a conversation with this child rather than me just marking it. I wanted it to mean something. And then we get to the conventional stage where the kids are starting to choose the appropriate text form. Um, sentence structure is improving. Um, they're selecting interesting vocabulary. They've got, they got far more sense of their audience. They're usually starting to use paragraphs by this stage. They're often in jolly grammar too. Some kids might be, it might take them a bit longer, but that's sort of often where they're at. They're still learning. They're still learning but they have become a writer. And if they are allowed to share their writing and if their writing is shown in the classroom and their parents are shown what they can do, they will get to love the process as well. So this is a, another one um, just talking about um, colours and they, you know, and about a cake that this child had eaten um, and she had to rate it out of 10. But they're, they're, more, they're, they're more able to control what they're doing. And as you could see from that last one, to actually write in paragraphs. Now, that's, they're the stages that kids go through. But kids do have difficulties at time. And a lot of children have difficulties with specific things that happen. Our job is to get the door open, not to keep it closed. Our job is to get the door open, zoom in on those kids and see what actually is the problem, what's stopping them from being able to let their thoughts go. So we have to, we have to look at why kids become reluctant writers. We have to be kind about this. We have to understand that there's a, a whole lot of skills that come together for a child to actually be able to write on a page. They've got their creativity coming in. They've got their pencil hole. They've got, you know, that sometimes their brains are going well ahead of their pencils. Sometimes it is incredibly difficult and they just give up. So some kids think it's irrelevant. Like, why do I have to write? Mum and dad don't write. Who writes? Why do we need to write? With those kids, it's essential that they get to see that these real books are around and they're actually written by real people. So, you know, whenever I read them a story or even or even a poem, you know, I say to them, do you know people wrote this? They, they wrote it down, then they looked at it and they changed it and changed it and changed it. You know, people actually write all these books that we love writing. And if I can get an author to come in to talk to the kids, that really works well at this stage. So they start to see the writing process as relevance. But if you're a parent or a teacher as well, if you write in front of the kids, you will help them with this. 
Some kids have got handwriting problems. I do. I'm a, I was a left-hander made to use my right hand and my writing is disgusting. If I try and write on the board with cursive writing, the kids will say, print, please, Vicky, because they just can't read my writing. Some kids do have problems with their writing. So look at that. Maybe sometimes write for them. You know, but don't don't punish them and think that they're not being creative because creative because their writing's not neat. You know, um, some of the kids will have tr- troubles with spelling. Spelling spelling skills have got nothing to do with intelligence at all. They're important, but they've got nothing to do with intelligence. So don't don't penalise a child's creativity because their spelling or their editing is poor. And the other thing, and I I identify with this second last one: inability to concentrate. It's sometimes really hard to keep your bottom on the chair and keep writing. I've got a lot of writing projects that I'm doing at the moment. And, you know, it takes a little bit of courage to sit in that chair and make yourself stay there for half an hour and keep writing. You know, and I'm an adult. Imagine what it's like for kids to be able to concentrate that long. And some of them have got visual difficulties too. And they find it really hard to even read their own handwriting, to look around the room for the words that they need on charts as well to help them. So these these technical difficulties, as I I call them, uh, they they will hold the children back sometimes. Sometimes planning. Sometimes they'll get the last thing that happened, you know, in the middle or the first one. So they have to be taught how to plan. And I've got a lot of kids who go, no, I don't have any ideas. So then I deliberately choose books that are about families where the person has actually written about their own families. And there are many, many like that. And I read those to them because all kids have got stories inside them. Then you get this this thing where um, their brain is going much faster than their pencil. And I'm sure you've all had that where you're writing or you're typing, whatever you're doing, but your your brain is throwing out the ideas at a much faster rate, okay? That that can be helped a lot by letting the children just occasionally record their stories onto Word with an iPad. I mean, there are all sorts of programs for this now, but I find Word is the most accurate one at the moment where they they just speak their story in, the words come up, and then we edit it together at the end. And we only do this occasionally because they've still got to be able to write and in fact I get them to copy those words down into their books as well but it's just nice occasionally to just let your eye you know your ideas come out it's the same I have the same feeling sometimes I'm trying to write something important and I'll say to Martin Martin can you just listen to this and write this down can you just type this down for me so I can just think aloud We, we all go through this so there's sometimes a, a frustration with what feels like the, the slow rate of the process. And if we allow um, editing and spelling skills and to dominate what we're doing or, or grammar or phonics, whatever it is, to dominate that, that really creative process, they'll stop. They'll shut down and they'll stop. They get bogged down with the technical aspects of writing, which is why we need to give them the best program. And that's really why I use Jolly Phonics and Jolly Grammar because of all the actions and colours and movement and everything. I want the kids to still stay engaged and I want their creativity to still be flowing. We need to give them the keys that will unlock this process. And we need to, we need to look at what do they actually need. So Brianna even though she could write and she could write quite neatly, as you can see, she is a perfectionist, a total perfectionist, refused to write unless I wrote first for her. So it was either had to be me or one of the other teachers had to write the words down. Then she was quite happy to copy them out. That went on for about nine months when she was in our classes and it drove me nuts you know, and I used to say, Brianna, do you think you could write some of your own words today? No, no, no. But she she wrote fairly creatively. And after a while, it was amazing. It, took, it did take about nine months. She just said one day, I could do that work. I think I could do those letters. And, you know, gradually she started to take over the process. But if we'd said, no, I'm not writing for you, do it yourself, the process would have stopped. So we need to be kind. 
So what she did was she got a writing slave, me, one of the other teachers. So, you know, I let the kids actually hire a writing slave, which means another teacher or a parent, all right, for two minutes. When I can see they're really bogged down, they can't get the ideas out, I just say to them, do you need a writing slave? Right? And they get someone to sit next to them to write for them for two minutes. Then they have to take over again. I can't tell you how successful that is. It's amazing. It really is that they know that there's help there if they really need it. It sort of opens the door. It really does. It opens the door and it helps them relax to what they're getting. Now, this is um, something that I put together some years ago and Chu Ye and I, um, we have brought out a book about mind journeys, but I just want to tell you a little bit about how this works. This is mind journeys um, are like visualisations, crafted visualisations to help the kids to get into um, a particular mindset, to get them to imagine a particular scenario and then usually we use them for writing. So, so we get them, the kids sit down and they listen. I read a visualisation out to them, okay? And then they're making mind pictures as we're doing that. And straight after that, usually I will get them to write about what they saw as, we were, as I was actually reading these mind journeys to them. And what will happen is they often solve particular problems that they've got, that they get some incredibly creative artwork after these. And this is, this is what the book looks like, Mind Journeys. I use this nearly every day, or nearly every day, you know, and I've written oh, at least another 50 to 80 Mind Journeys as well after this. This book was to help teachers and parents know how to help kids to use their imagination to improve comprehension and also creative writing. Now, it's sold out at the moment. I think it's been reprinted twice. Um, Chu Ye and I are working on the process at the moment of turning it into an ebook, so that so that you can still get hold of it. Um, we've got um, particular mind journeys about emotional intelligence, literacy, celebrations, you know, Easter, Chinese New Year, all of those sorts of things. And teachers or parents choose the one they want. You know, you lower the lights and sometimes we actually use green screens as well to help the kids to get into the particular situation because we want them to imagine that they really are in there. This is, I was writing about fairyland and so we had a green screen for me to, to, to put myself into to fairyland. Um, here I am taking a group of kids in Singapore um, at Chu Year Centre and basically, you can see the lights are down low. We've got little candles. I want a sense of magic, you know, to go with, with, with what the kids are doing. So they had to sit, they had to shut their eyes, and they had to listen as we read these visualisations. And this is the one that I did. So I put instructions for, for all of these. So um, the children sit with their legs crossed in a dark room. They close their eyes and relax. And so you read them the visualisation, all right? And you can see the visualisation there. I'm not going to read all of this out to them, but I wanted them to feel that they really were a, a raindrop, that that's what they were. And I want them to feel it all. So, you know, I, I put feelings in like I'm sitting in a cloud with my all my friends and I'm growing bigger and bigger. You know, soon I will fall and I'm frightened. And so it went on and on and on. And then, then I say to the kids, open your eyes and gently stretch. Bring, bring your mind back into this room and I want you to write as if you were the raindrop. Tell about everything you're feeling and what you can see. Try to write a whole page on the special writing page your teacher gives you. By the way, this also works um, very, very well with um, teaching remotely as well. So, you know, face-to-face -face or remote teaching. Now, I've got a few examples of kids' work there to show you. I'm not going to read them all, but for instance, Grace, which is the third one down, Grace would always write quite minimally. She, she really didn't want to write very much. But this really let her ideas go. I'm a raindrop. I burst into the world. I see things that I never saw before. The breeze pushes me towards a dark but pretty forest. I see animals rushing to the shelter and a meadow. And she goes on and on and on. My watery body is split in half. I mean, she's only seven, seven years of age. Amazing. Um, David 
who's just above her, I'm a raindrop falling slowly and glistening as I descend from the evaporating cloud dripping magic. Um, I am a raindrop falling from the sky. I'm gazing down at the ground, waiting to join my sisters and brothers, and we are happy because we will become a river. We will be home to fish, turtles, and water bugs. That kid, David, David was six, turning seven. He was the hardest child I've ever taught to write. He would just sit there the whole time. But this one time, he let his ideas out, and I was so excited. So, you know, I've got loads and loads and loads of examples of children. Um, Connor was a child um, who actually had some brain damage. He had a lot of difficulties, but this helped him as well. It helped him to be able to imagine. So, so mind journeys work. And within the mind journeys book, I've got a whole chapter about how to write your own mind journeys because I actually think that all of us can write mind journeys. I've got lots of children now who like to write mind journeys and get me to read it out to the children to get them to write. Now, another, another thing that you can do to really help all kids find their writing voice is know literature really well. So if you want them to be able to write a poem, write a poem in front of them, you know, show them lots of poetry books, not, not just one. Um, I've got um, one here, The Queen of the Night, that I, I love to read to children. And we talk about our fears and then the kids write about their fears and they often make a little narrative around their fears as well. You need to know children's writing. Even if you've got no interest in it at all, if you really want kids to be good writers, you need to read to them and you need to know which books. It's important. So if you want kids to have more confidence with their creativity, and in fact, if you want it for yourself, read this book, The Dot. It's amazing. Absolutely amazing book. And it will empower you as well. Make sure, make sure that you give them the tools, by the way, the absolute tools to help them. So, you know, I have never found a better dictionary than this Jolly Dictionary. It's easy to use. Kids love it, right? And also teach them how to use a thesaurus. Teach, teach them those skills so that they, they can switch on their inner writers. They, they, they've got books all over the classroom at the home to get ideas from, all right, and they can switch on their inner writers. So they need those skills. They really do. And it's us that have to open the doors and provide them. So with modelled writing, I often write in front of the children. I've got a flip chart that I use in my classroom to do that. And it might be as simple as just um, somebody's news. They tell me their news. I write it down. You know, um, I might write a description of the beach. If I want them to do a, an acrostic poem, I'll write one in front of them. Occasionally, the kids will copy it. That's all right. I'm not, I'm not worried about that, you know. I just want them to know how to do it. We can't, we can't be giving kids homework or, or things to do and they, they don't know how to do it. So let's teach them how. Let's make sure that we show them exactly the sort of thing that we want them to do. Um, make, making up mind maps is very, very helpful for kids' writing. You know, sometimes we might just do the mind map. You know, so we were learning about the firefighter this particular day this, this work is quite interesting, actually, because this child was in primary four, five age, roughly, and he really hated writing, hated writing so much. But he, he fell in love with this book about firefighters. He was really, really interested. So when he'd finished, I said to him, well, let, let's do a mind map, because we do lots of mind mapping about the firefighter, about the book. And he wrote it. And I just left it for a few days and I went back to her and I said, okay, let's take that mind map, let's take all our mind maps and now let's turn it into some writing. And he, he was very happy to do that because he'd already got his ideas out on the page. Um, I, I like to do a lot of sensory stuff for the kids. So this is, um, we were doing some painting with spices. So you can see this is just an egg carton. I put a bit of white paint in each part and I put spices in there. OK, and we we were writing, I can't remember exactly what, but something about the joy in our life, the spice in our life, what makes us really happy. We mixed those paints up and then we the kids had to to draw a picture first of really joyful, happy things. 
and then they wrote about them. And then when we put them up all over the classroom, the whole classroom smelled so good. Um, if you've got a child who just loves to draw and that's the way they express themselves, just accept it. You know, like this child was about, you know, wrote a, a story about the ninjas, but he didn't write very much. It's all he wrote. He was eight years of age. And I, I was just about going nuts with this kid. Like, can't you write some more words, blah, blah, blah. T tell me about your story. You know, 10 minutes later, I was still listening to his story. All of it was in the picture. And I think that's, that's sort of okay. He actually has graduated from high school now and he got top marks. Amazing. He's an incredible little writer now, but he needed to express himself pictorially for quite a long time. And we need to be aware of their needs and go along with it, not expect them all to perform at the same time, you know, exactly the same skills. That's ridiculous. That's not how learning happens. So we need to, to guide them. Oops, we need to, I'm just going to go back. We need to guide them um, with these opportunities that we're talking about. So if we want to teach them about poetry, teach them poetry. If you want to teach them about how to write a narrative, show them lots of narratives introduce them to different authors. Studying pictures and writing back pictures is also, um, excuse me, this is really important. Some years ago, I went to Canberra for a trip to see my daughter and I went to the National Gallery, which is a wonderful place there, and I bought a set of Australian art for children, all right, and it was these are real painters done by um, real artists, but each one has actually got um, a story, a narrative in there, and there's something happening that the children can write about. And they have been so popular. So the kids look at the pictures, we brainstorm them, we look at all the vocabulary and whatnot, and then the kids just write some stories or just some sentences about that particular piece of art. Plus, they've been learning about artists and art as well. So I'm sure that you've got the same thing. I mean, you've got wonderful art galleries, all of you in your own countries. Singapore, definitely, you've got amazing museums and art galleries. So as simple as just looking at a picture, writing captions and writing about them. Um, Chu Ye and I collaborated together on that Prince Miller book, and we've also brought out some pictures that the children can sequence the story with, but occasionally I give the kids just one of the pictures and I get them to write about that picture. So if you look around at what you've already got, you've probably got some fantastic pictures that you can use. This, this was a, I've got a thing about dragons. I love dragons and a lot of the kids that I teach love them as well. And this was just from um, an old calendar that I put in the bin actually. And the kids said, no, you know, we want those pictures still. So I cut the pictures up. And then they decided they wanted to write about them. So they, they gave this particular dragon a name, Zavendon, and they wanted to write about him. And that was, I, I wrote for them. They told me what to write and I wrote and then we got it typed up. That was so popular, that particular page. They loved it. So get them to also allow them to think. You know, kids love questions. You know, I just had a, a big area in the classroom, I didn't have anything on that particular wall, but I'd painted it like a blackboard. And I thought, hmm, maybe we'll use that as a question board. So I just would say to the kids, you know, regularly, anybody got any questions that they'd like us to write down? And they, you know, kids have always got lots of questions and I would write them down. And if we have a spare moment, pick one of those questions and write the answer. It was amazing the stuff they came up with. Like, um, do people go to heaven if they choose to die? I mean, that's that's a very deep question. What would it be like without God? Um, and the one above that, um, um, what if life was really a, really a video game? You know, what if people turned into toys? They are great topics to get them writing, all right? So let them, let them ask questions. And I, then I've got, um, a couple of strategies, this one in particular, for my super reluctant kids. And, and in fact, it's become so popular that we're using this a lot now. Um, this particular child, he hated writing more than any kid I've ever, ever, ever worked with. And he was, he was in the year, which is sort of next to secondary. 
um, here. He was actually in year six, but he'd never really written anything he liked. He hated it. He, he told me definitely, I hate that, Vicky. I really hate it. So I got some boxes and I thought, I wonder what would happen if I just put some objects in the boxes and we somehow related those objects together. So I did. I called them story boxes. I've now got about 30 out in my classroom. So you can see there's a cotton bud there, a moonstone, an ox, because it was here of the ox, and I've got a coin there. And I tipped it out and I said, okay, Michael, how can we write a story, a little narrative about these things? It's got to have these things in it. And he went for it. I couldn't believe it. I was so surprised. This is what he ended up doing. Once upon a time, there lived a talking ox. His name was Benedetto. People came from far and wide to listen to Benedetto's poems. So you, you can read the rest yourself, but they paid his owner lots of money. Nobody knew that he had a magic moonstone. The moonstone gave him the power to talk, right? This is the, the ox, obviously. So Benedetto polished his magic stone every day with a soft polishing stick, right? And that was a cotton bud. He wrote poems about his friends. Here is one of his poems. Pedro likes to eat. He has smelly feet. People run away with him. They do not play. I mean, that was, that's coming from a kid who would never write more than just two sentences. And once he got his voice, once he got his writing voice, I couldn't stop him because this, this is sort of what happens. Circle stories are where you get the talking stick. So it might be something as simple as this, or you might wrap alfoil or something shiny over a stick and you start the story, you know, a long time ago in an ancient forest. And then I pass it to somebody else and they add a bit more on, then they pass it to somebody else and you can record it. Somebody can be writing it down. Kids like that. They love doing that. And story stones are just exactly that. They are just stones that I buy from a garden centre. Then I go and buy stickers. And there might be, you know, um, fairy tale pictures, all sorts, you know, the stickers that you can buy, so many of them. And I just put the stickers straight on the stones, make them up into little bags, and the kids go and get a bag and they've got story stones. They're allowed to take three out. They're not allowed to pick. They've got to just take three out. And then they write about those particular stones. So simple. And it's, it's cheap and it's easy. And it's got to fulfill those conditions to really work for me. Um, so make sure that you give kids strategies, all right, that you use strategies that will stimulate them. So give them a, a good context for writing. So, if, you know, if you're coming up towards Christmas, write to Santa. You know, um, try writing to children. So we've got a post box in the classroom where we all write to each other. Kids write to me, I write to them, you know, and we've, we've done that for years. Kids don't get letters and they love getting letters. I even choose a child every now and again and I send a letter to their home. They always, always write back and it, get, it gets them writing as well. So there are things like um, writing with different media. You know, don't always write with pencil. It's actually quite boring. Write with a coloured pen or write with a marker. Write, what? write with something different and create small worlds. I, I like doing that. I like getting a tray and making, you know, a magic enchanted garden. Because it's spring here, we're going to be doing that this term. We've got holidays coming up at the end of this week. All right, and then after that, we're going to be making little trays and there'll be little mirrors in them and there'll be the lakes and there'll be their special little spring gardens. It's a small world and we're going to be writing about those as well. So creating small worlds is something children really love. I also, I've got a, a you know, um, a classroom that can easily, you can dim the lights and we do what we call rave on writing. I've got a big gong in the classroom. When we hit that gong, that means everybody writes, everybody teaches, everybody writes, right? And we usually write for seven or eight minutes, have quiet music on the background, and you can write anything you like. I don't even if they care if they just write, oh, Vicky makes us do this stupid writing, you know, I don't want to do this, whatever. The rule is your pencil is not allowed to stop wiggling on your page for all that time. And teachers write as well. So we sit there, we're a writing community, and we write and write and write. Families can do this too. If a child can't write yet, they can draw pictures of what's in their head, you know. 
but a whole family can sit down, rave on writing. You can, you can keep it down to five minutes. Rave on means just keep going. Just don't. It's like some people who never, ever, they're never quiet. They just rave on, rave on, rave on. Well, this is raving on with a pencil in your hand. That's been extraordinarily useful for me, really, really useful. Um, and what we do is we hit the gong at the beginning of the writing, and then I choose somebody to hit the gong at the end. Um, so I write to them a lot. You know, you can see these kids. I was in Singapore um, to do some workshops two or three years ago, and he's written, I'm already missing you. I hope you're having a great time. Um, I, this is what happens when I get back from a trip. I often see that kids have written to me and then I write back to them as well. And it's, it's not rocket science. This is quite simple stuff, but it's giving them a reason to write, giving them a reason to write. So, you know, writing little notes to your children, getting them to write back to you, having a family graffiti board can work really well. I like, I like this one. Um, I do not think you are true. Give me a surprise. <laughs> Um, and I asked my high school kids, I had some year eight kids, that's the first year of high school, I asked them to actually tell me what they thought would help them with their writing, because I had a group of teachers coming in for a workshop the next day. So this is what they write, dear, dear teacher, you, here are some ways to make us write, all right, uh, make some general topics so we can have a choice, so they, they want to have a choice, let us write in colours. So they wanted to write in coloured gel pens, you know, and provide a colourful and relaxing classroom, provide real rewards for everyone <laughs> every time we do something right and provide an extra helper for our assistant. So that was that was so good. They all wrote down exactly what they thought they needed. Um, these have been very popular. You can do these at home or in your own schools. I've made a set of these and I, I sell these as well where I've got vocab their vocabulary sheets. So they've got words for the kids to use. So some of the kids who worried about spelling, you know, not sure of what words, I just put words to use there so that those words have to appear in the story. And then um, I get the kids to think, you know, people have got lots of ideas about aliens and flying saucers. What do you think? Look carefully at the pictures and make a narrative about it. You know, sometimes cutting, cutting the writing tasks down to just something manageable and giving them some vocabulary can really help them. I'm talking, obviously, about older writers here, but I've done some of these fairly young writers as well. So, so what you're doing is you're supporting them. So I, what I want you to remember is that all kids can write. You just need to provide the support. Story grammar is just simply understanding that in a story, there's a setting, there are characters, something has to happen. If nothing happens, it's not a story. There has to be a problem, a little conflict, something has to happen. So all you're doing as you do these strategies is you're opening the door to help them. Timed writing means just that. Don't make them write any more than seven or eight minutes at a time. Always stop them after that. This is how I use my gong. Stop them after that and let's share, let's read aloud, let's edit what we've done so far. It cuts the pain down, cuts the pain down to actually put a time limit. That's my gong. It's a Chinese gong. I bought it in a garden centre for 50 bucks and I tell you, it's one of the best things I've ever bought. So we're going to nurture children. We're going to take these strategies and any others that you know of and nurture kids. Make sure that you have got, you know, dictionaries, paper, all the things that they need. And remember that when kids make mistakes, let's just signpost to learning for them and help them, help these perfectionists that we've got. And when they make a mistake, go, this is good. You've got a mistake there. I can help you with that. And when we make a mistake, that is just showing us how to do it properly. We just make a mistake, we learn about it, and then we carry on. You know, books and models, we can borrow ideas from books. That's perfectly all right. Authors do that all the time. Make sure there are words everywhere in your home or in your classroom and accept that there are individual differences. Now, I like Stephen King's work when I really need to escape. I like to read his stories. I don't know when he started writing. He might have started writing at five. He might have started writing at 25. I don't know. I don't know what his spelling's like either. 
All I know is his ideas are amazing. These are very exciting books to read, you know. Um, I'm reading Agatha Raisin books at the moment, which are not terribly exciting, but they're relaxing books to read as you try to go to sleep, you know. And I'm looking at how she's constructed the books, you know. What, what we need to do is we need to accept that kids write differently. They have different sorts of ideas. We just need to provide the nurture and the situations that will support them as they learn. Um, I've got this learning tree. I've used this now for 20 years in different ways. At the moment, I've got an outside one outside my classroom. And on the learning tree, there are symbols of everything that we've learned all through the year. So it's it's everything comes off there at the end of the year. And then we start at the beginning of the next year and there'll be Chinese New Year lanterns and poems hanging up and all sorts of things. When, when they do things, we hang them up and display them. Kids will often go and sit under those trees to get ideas and always have little lights over them to try and get a magical feeling. It's a small world, right, that the kids uh, made. That was all about spring. So publish their work, not all the time. You don't have to publish everything, you know, but you might want to type some of it out, you know, send it off to grandma or, I don't know, email it to them. But let them help them to feel proud of what they've done. So you want a visually stimulating sort of background, you know, environment, but you, it needs to be ordered as well. So I've always loved this, make something predictable so the unpredictable can happen. So let the kids know that you definitely will model the writing. You'll show them how to do something, that the dictionary is over there, this is over here, so they know about the help that they can get. And if they want a writing slave, they can get one. Show them that you value words by reading yourself. Read, read and read. Read to them and also try and write yourself. Try and get into that lovely, joyful, creative writing space, you know, and make sure that the nuts and bolts of the skills that they need are actually done. We, you need to learn to think out of the box and experiment. You really, you really do. This is a rug that we've had for years and I still use it when a kid is absolutely stuck. I go, oh, you know, I think that you need the flying carpet. And they go, what? I go, the carpet, you know, the flying carpets that you find in, in stories and whatnot. And most of them have heard of that. And I go, you know what? I spoke to some people in Arab Street in Singapore when I bought this and I I spoke to them about flying carpets and they said, are you aware, lady, that your body doesn't go flying off? It's your mind. When you sit on a flying carpet, it's your mind. So I've got this flying carpet that I bought for about $10 at a, a, some sort of jumble sale and kids actually get it, put it on the ground and sit on it to get an idea. You know, And I, I swear, occasionally I do the same thing and I reckon it works. I reckon that the ideas start to come in. So support them, teach them how to proofread and edit, all right? Um, if you have to write for them for a while, do it. But value their work. Model to them, you know, and bathe them in narrative. Read to them every day. Kids are stories, and they've got plenty of stories to share. This was a piece of writing that a child did that was so sad. You know, but, but it was a story and it really happened. This kid heard a, a little bird crying and didn't know what had happened. And so he actually put the little bird in his pocket and he ran back home. And then when he got home, um, his baby cousin was there, you know, a, the new baby. So he was um, he, he wanted to play with the baby and everything like that. So it was a really special time. Right. And then they had, you know, some foods and everything like that. About eight o'clock after they had their dinner and the cousin was leaving, um, went into the living room to watch TV. And then he realised that the bird was still in his pocket and he hadn't tried to put it back in the nest, which is what he intended. And it died. It actually died. The sad, the sad news was I discovered the death of the bird. The birdie was dead. I sadly buried it in the backyard. I will never forget this moment. I killed the bird. And that was that's actually a story, a true story. And it was really, really sad. But he wanted to write about it because it really mattered to him. So, so just to sum up, to finish off, help, help your children to observe. You know, if you take them to gardens by the bay or somewhere like that, don't just walk around snapping photos. Help the kids to look, to look closely, right? Um, if you get a, a big thunderstorm, 
all right? Or, you know, if you're living somewhere like I am and you get hailstones, get the kids to, to stand at the window watching it, all right? Get them to get to know the interests of children. You know, learn to think differently. Learn to think out of the box, you know? And, you know, just to finish, and I'm sure I've gone over time because I usually do, um, we, I'll help you as much as I can in this process. If there's anything I've said and you think, oh, I really want to know about that, you can get me on Facebook. You can get me easily everywhere, you know. Um, and those particular writing sheets that I showed you, there are quite a few of those in my Teachers Pay Teachers store. And if you go in there, they will ask you to join. It won't cost anything. But then you can follow different teachers and you can actually hover your mouse above different products and just get lots of ideas for writing in there as well. So it's helped me as much as much as I love writing for that particular website. I also love to go in there to get lots of ideas for teaching as well and, and good ideas for parenting too. So thank you. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, as I say, I could talk on this for a whole day. In fact, I do sometimes. But it's, it's been wonderful and it's been wonderful to share it at this special event with you. And it's particularly wonderful to have my co-author of quite a few books, Chu Ye here. Um, and I, I remember saying to Chu Ye, everyone's got a writer. You can write. You know you can. And Chu Ye hasn't even mentioned one of the books that she's going to to get finished one day with the one about the kind birds. Chu Ye has got an amazing true story and one day we will write that so congratulations again to september 21 all the staff but also to ken lynn and chu yeah and thank you thank you for coming along first thing in the morning and not sleeping in and and listening i really enjoy presenting to you